Hey, what is up mortals? It is Esper Kvye here with a new video for you. Welcome to part 12 of What If Deku Was the Shield Hero. I just wanted to greet you guys by saying sit back and relax, you're in for a treat. And so, we begin. The day after the USJ incident, Izuku found himself lying on his bed as school had been cancelled for the day. Honestly, this was not all that surprising to the young shield hero, given the fact that there was a villain attack on such a high-profile area like UA. The heroes no doubt had their hands full talking to the police and double-checking the USJ to ensure that nothing else, like uh, a bomb, had been left behind. They were probably also looking into a way to prevent people from just warping into the school grounds. Sure, warp quirks were really rare, but given what had just happened, hmm. Izuku also thought that they might also be doing this to help the students relax, something the teen was, was finding very difficult to do right now as he nervously scrolled through his phone while one eye darted at the clock. Slowly, he chewed on his lower lip, barely even reading any of the numerous articles that talked about what had happened at the school, as he instead focused on the sounds of his mother cooking tonight's dinner. Even through the closed door, he could hear the sizzle of the pans and the tuneless hum his mother was making, the one she only used when she was fixing up a larger meal. A part of him wished with all his might that his mother was only doing this because she wanted to celebrate her son coming back alive from such a massive villain attack, but he knew that wasn't the case. He also knew that he shouldn't be this nervous, and yet he couldn't help himself. Just then, the doorbell rang, causing Izuku to sit up straight on his bed so quickly that he might have tumbled forward. Without another thought, Izuku jumped off the bed and raced to the front door before his mother could even turn away from her craft. With his heart beating swiftly, the green-haired teen opened the door to see Raftalia standing in the doorway, wearing a red blouse that reminded him of her hero costume and jeans. And in her hands was a small cake box. Thank you for having me over tonight. I hope I'm not too late. No, 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 you're, you're, you're just in time. Izuku then took the box dessert without really thinking about it, just staring at Raftalia. The moon's glow was right behind her, almost giving her this angelic look that highlighted her features. He watched as she raised a hand, the same one that had the bracelet he had given her yesterday, to her cheek as she looked away while a blush crept over her face. Also, Izuku noticed that her tail was swaying slightly. So are you going to invite me in? Oh, oh, right, sorry. Quickly, Izuku stepped aside, allowing the Tanaki girl to walk in. Once inside, Inko quickly approached the teenage girl just as Izuku closed the door. Raftalia, sweetie, it's been so long since I last saw you. It's been a long time, Miss Midoriya. As Izuku moved out of the way, he watched as his mother wrapped her arms around Raftalia to embrace her in a loving hug. He also noticed Inko giving him a look with a knowing smile, something that caused the teen to feel somewhat worried for some reason. Finally, the hug ended. Thank you so much for having me. Inko waved off the comment as she gestured for the pair to follow her into the kitchen, which they did, walking toward the source of various mouthwatering scents. Oh, think nothing of it. After what happened yesterday, I was just so worried about you. I know you two are strong, but you're still only students and first years no less. Taking on that many villains by surprise must have been a scare. Oh, if I had been there, I would have fainted from dehydration a dozen times. The thought of a sweet young girl like yourself going to an empty apartment after going through all that? Well, I'd feel much better knowing you were all right. Have you talked to your parents? As the teens took their seats at the table, Raftalia looked ready to hide her face behind her hands. I did. As soon as the news hit, my parents called. As you could imagine, they were naturally very worried about me. My dad even had this insane theory that those people who kidnapped me were trying to get me back and that the entire USJ incident was just some big cover-up. Even more so when he remembered that Izuku was there as well. It took me hours to get him to calm down and not have him pull me out of UA. Izuku turned to look at Raftalia with a mixture of shock and horror. Wait, wait, he, he was going to do that? Why? To be honest, it wasn't just him, but my mother as well. They seemed to think that UA wasn't taking the safety of the students seriously enough if that many villains could sneak into the school. I had to remind them that the only reason they could even get in was because of a warp quirk, which is very rare. Not to mention this was the first time something like this has happened. Well, it's hard to blame them. Both teens turned to look at Inko, who was using her quirk to levitate dishes filled with food while holding two glasses of water, one in each hand. Gently, she placed the drinks in front of the teens while giving Raftalia a knowing smile before walking over to her green-haired child. I can understand where your parents are coming from. After what happened whenever I was out with my little Izuku and lost sight of him, I still had those same fears your father had. And even after all these years, that fear still pops up from time to time. 
It must be so much worse for your parents considering how long you were with those villains and the state you were in when they found you. Perhaps it might help if they knew someone nearby was checking up on you? I would be more than happy to do that if it would help with their minds at ease. Raftalia's face brightened at that as she leaned forward a bit. That would be wonderful. Smiling, Inko clapped her hands as she sat down at the table. Great, now that that's settled, let's enjoy the meal while it's still hot. It's been so long since we had company like this. As Inko spoke, both she and Izuku couldn't help but glance over at a picture on the nearby wall. One showing a very young Izuku from a time before he got his shield sitting next to an equally young Katsuki. Both boys were smiling brightly at the camera, holding up their forks as if proud they had learned how to spear their food. And it seemed that Raftalia had followed their gazes as she looked at the picture with surprise. Is that Bakugo? It's so weird seeing him smiling so kindly like that. He usually just scowls at everyone. Yeah, Kachan used to come over here all the time with his mom back when we were little. Inko let out a little laugh as everyone began digging into their food. I remember when I took that picture, Kotsky was so sweet, telling me that my cooking was a thousand times better than his mother's. Though Mitsuki didn't care too much for that comment. Izuku, do you remember how they started yelling at each other at the table? Izuku couldn't help but laugh as well, as he remembered Mitsuki roughly grabbing Kachan's head as she yelled at him for the insult to her cooking. Then how Kachan had fought hard to turn and look at her, saying it wasn't his problem if she couldn't handle the truth. Kind of hard to forget any of their fights. I can count on one hand the number of times I've seen them together and not yelling at each other. Izuku, you told me that you and Bakugo had been childhood friends. But the way you're both talking right now, did something happen? As Raftalia asked her question, the mood at the table became a bit more somber as both Midorias looked down at their meals. It took a bit, but eventually Inko raised her head to look at Raftalia with a saddened smile. To be honest, it was a little heartbreaking for both of us. After Izuku came back from the hospital, Kotsky seemed... different. His mother thought that he was just acting distant, but to me he seemed nervous. The whole time he was here, Pekotsky barely said a word. Naturally, that was a huge red flag for everyone. Not only that, he would do everything he could to avoid looking at Izuku. He wouldn't even go and play heroes anymore. As time went on, Mitsuki would have to drag Kotsky here kicking and screaming until finally... She gave up. Then shortly after that, she stopped coming over as often. Inko let out a sigh. It's not like we're complete strangers now. We sometimes meet up for coffee and to chat or talk on the phone. I just wish I knew what happened to that sweet boy. Well, uh, I, I haven't given up on Kachan. Even after all this time, I, I still consider him a friend. Inko and Raftalia smiled at the statement. Though Raftalia's was a bit forced, from what she had seen of the blonde in class, it was hard to believe that he could be friends with Izuku. The two were like oil and water. Anyways, enough of this depressing talk. Raftalia, Izuku told me that you once caught a swordfish. That sounds so exciting. And from there, the night went off without another word about Bakugo, but with some minimal embarrassment for Izuku. This video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN allows you to change your IP address, making it harder to track and securing your privacy. In addition to providing safe passage through the web, you can also expand the reach of your favorite streaming services like Disney+. Plus. If you're from the United States, you won't be able to watch any of the MCU and Sony Spider-Man movies. But by switching your location to Japan, you can access them whenever you want. Check out the link in the description to get three extra months when you purchase the 12-month subscription plan that costs $99.99 a year. This deal is for a limited time, and thanks to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video. When classes resumed, Izuku and Raftalia walked into 1A to find that most of the students were discussing how the news had handled the events of the USJ. Some people, like Kaminari, Ojiro, and Saro, had brought up the way some people were staring at them and whispering to each other as they no doubt recognized them from the news. At the same time, Mineta bemoaned loudly that not a single hottie had approached him. What had drawn the ire of some students, like the pink-skinned Ashido and Kirishima, was how some sites were focused on the three other weapon users. Most of those articles featured a photo of the three standing together, waving proudly to cameras and seeming to bask in the praises they were receiving before focusing on their deeds during the attack while leaving out certain details. This ticked off Ashido in a way Izuku had never seen before. Can you believe it? They're making it sound like we did nothing until those three showed up. Kirishima fought a villain made of living sludge along with Sue and Midoriya. Uh, thanks for reminding me. I still haven't gotten the taste out of my mouth, Kirishima said, almost retching as he pictured the taste again. Todoroki froze a whole bunch of villains before heading over to save All Might. Hey, what about me? I was there, you know, Jiro said, feeling a bit left out. 
Yo, Yorozu, Toru, Jiro, and Kaminari not only fought a whole bunch of villains, but were also the ones who took down the creep that was keeping us from calling for help. Let's not forget Raftalia and Bakugo. They fought their fair share of villains before heading out to try and help All Might. Raftalia even fought their boss. Uh, that's true, but what I did wasn't much of an accomplishment. It's not like I brought him to jail. But you totally cut him up a bunch! I bet you landed more hits on him than anyone else. And don't think I haven't forgotten about your partner in kicking butt. Midoriya totally tanked a blow from that monster before getting right back up and smacking that handman jerk with his shield. So why are some people focusing so much on the three who showed up late to the party? Well, when you stop and think about it, it does make a bit of sense, Ribbit. Several people in the class turned to look at Sue, who was sitting in her seat, looking at the group with her usual neutral expression while also placing a finger on her cheek. Those three already have their provisional licenses and have rare weapon-type quirks. Pretty soon, they're going to be leaving UA and entering into the hero business. It would make sense that there would be people out there who would prefer to read about them. Besides, it's not like every article out there is focusing on them. Not to mention, they all look really good for the camera. Shots like these can really help make the next big name, Jiro said. Jiro added on. At that moment, Ida approached them while making a chopping motion with his arm. Asui is correct. I told you to call me Sue. These three brave upperclassmen came to our aid when we needed them the most, and how do you repay them? By complaining that some sites are focusing on them, giving these three the righteous credit they deserve. That's not what I'm saying at all. Yeah, man, no one here is saying that they shouldn't get any credit. Before either Kirishima or Ida could say another word, the door to the classroom opened. Oh my, such naughty boys and girls not in their seats. Whatever shall I do? As the students all quickly took their seats, Midnight strode into the room in her full hero garb. As she took the spot in front of him, all but one of the students could feel a wave of worry for their normal homeroom teacher. They all knew that Recovery Girl was a master at healing, mending most injuries anywhere between a f mending most injuries in anywhere between a few seconds to a day or two. Were Mr. Aizawa's injuries that severe, or was he injured beyond the abilities of Recovery Girl to heal? The only one whose mind was not going down this path was Mineta who was already drooling all over his desk while his eyes traveled up and down the pro hero's costume. Ma'am, is Mr. Aizawa all right, Ribbit? Much to everyone's surprise, Midnight let out a chuckle. Well, he certainly thinks he's all right. Despite all the brutal damage the man took, he thought he could just walk out of the nurse's office this morning and continue teaching like nothing happened. Something about not wanting to waste time. Thankfully, I was called in to help stop the man from pushing himself too hard. Izuku nodded, his mind going back to the notebook he had written many years ago about Midnight's quirk. She had the ability to produce a powerful sleeping gas from her skin. Something like that was the best way to restrain a person without hurting them. Provided there was someone nearby to catch Mr. Aizawa when he fell. For the time being, I will be taking over as your homeroom instructor. Just until Recovery Girl gives Aizawa the all clear and asks me to help unstrap him. Out of the corner of his eye, Izuku could see several faces turning either slightly pink or full-blown red. No doubt they were imagining what she meant by that. Now I want all of you to keep your eyes and ears on me, since I have an important announcement to make. In two weeks, the UA Sports Festival will begin. What? Are you serious? We nearly all got killed a few days ago, as Mineta jumped onto the top of his desk, pointing a finger at midnight as he screamed out his objection at the top of his lungs. A few other students began to mutter in agreement. Midnight, however, stood there for several long moments with a smile on her face that slowly began to fade until it was nothing more than a thin line. Faster than most of the students' eyes could see, the pro hero had pulled out her whip and cracked it. Instantly, the class became silent except for Mineta, who had fallen to the floor, and yelped. Silence! You're all being too naive if you think that the school would cancel something as important as the UA Sports Festival after one villain attack. And you are all being especially foolish to think that after said villain attack, we would not be upping security for the event. While I am not at liberty to discuss the finer details of all the upgrades we are doing to make sure everyone is safe, I can tell you we are calling in a number of additional heroes to help patrol the grounds, and those will be on top of the heroes that will be in the audience. Midnight, seeing that the class was absorbing her words, let out a sigh before visibly relaxing. From there, Midnight reminded the class of just how important the UA Sports Festival was. Not just to the world at large, the event being watched all over the world like the Olympics, but to the students as well. This was their chance to start getting scouted by pros, who would then offer internships to those who showed potential in their eyes. Getting these offers and gaining these experiences might make the difference for their futures, 
either going pro themselves one day, or remaining a sidekick for life. In the end, all of you need to give this festival your whole heart and soul. Show the crowd your passion burning inside of you. Make sure you shine brighter than anyone else. And then the bell rang. Later, after school, Izuku and Raftalia were heading out through the gates of Yue, only to find a figure waiting for them with a smile on her face. It was Malty Melremark. She stood there looking a little nervous as she shifted from side to side while lightly biting her lower lip. Hey, excuse me, Midoriya. I was hoping we could talk, uh, in private, if that's okay. Izuku blinked in surprise, taken aback by this display. He could still remember how she acted when they first met, full of fake sweetness as she latched on to Motoyasu. But now that girl had been replaced by someone who seemed to be a completely different person. Was she scared about something? Embarrassed? He then remembered the look Principal Nezu had given her, wondering what that had been about. Look, and, uh, and now's not the... Now isn't the greatest. I promise it won't take very long. I need to speak to you about something important. With a sigh, Izuku looked over to Raftalia, who gave him a quick nod of understanding. And so, the two walked away from the school grounds, with none of them aware that a certain furry principal was watching them from his window. Twenty minutes later, Izuku found himself standing in the corner of a park full of lush vegetation and trails leading into nearby forested areas. Despite the beauty all around him, the green-haired boy could not shake the eerie feeling he was getting right now. Not only was the park empty, but the streets surrounding the park seemed barren. The only signs of life that his ears could pick up were the buzzing of insects. Wasn't this going a bit too far if she just wanted some privacy? So, as he stood there looking at the red-haired girl who had brought him here, a hand went for his phone as a precaution. If something happened, he'd use his shield prison on himself before sending his location to Raftalia and the local... I'd like to apologize to you. Malty's sudden words, along with a bow, caught Izuku off guard. So much so that he nearly stumbled backward. I, I was the one that told Motoyasu about the rumor going around. The one about you and Raftalia. How you were using her to fight your battles for you. It, it, it was just a silly rumor going around, you know? Honestly, I had no idea that Motoyasu would take it so seriously and that he would stop in the middle of a rescue to accuse you. Izuku blinked as he slowly absorbed this information. To be honest, he had already mostly forgotten about that silly rumor. Why are you telling me this now? Because I don't want Motoyasu to get in trouble. Ever since the USJ incident, he's been contacted by various hero agencies trying to recruit him when he graduates. Some of them are even big names like Gang Orca and, and Yoru Imasha. Motoyasu has worked really hard to get to this point, and having his skills recognized by such big names means the world to him. But all that might get taken away if they ever find out how he behaved during certain parts of the USJ incident. And if he lost all that because of a rumor I told him about, I don't know how I could ever forgive myself. Izuku nodded, now understanding the situation as he relaxed. Now it made sense why she wanted to be so far away from prying ears. Just... tell him to think twice about what he hears from now on. With that, Izuku hightailed it out of the park at full speed, heading towards the train station, in hopes he could make his train. However, the next morning, as Izuku was eating his breakfast, there was a knock at the door. Confused, Inko walked over to open it, finding a detective and two police officers. Ma'am, can we ask you and your son to come down to the station? We need to ask him some questions. Thank you all for indulging yourselves in all this information thus far. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, there are a few more things that I'd like to go over before the video ends. Firstly, I'd like to thank our patrons, BD Flames, Ethan Davis, Terry Chills, Shifter Meals, Adam Zagel, Zill, XAV Beat 3 and Joshua Phelps. Secondly, I'd also like to thank all of our YouTube members, Toei Acosta, Rob the King, Sith Lord 906, CF2364, and Knuckles, Rimuo Tempest, Angel Juarez, Donald C. Stewart, Bryant Greer, and Demonized Fox. Thirdly, if you're in the mood for some great storytelling, We the Celestials has you covered. Our We the Celestials My Hero Academia and Naruto What If channels retell the story of their namesake anime with a twist. Check it out if you're interested. Fourthly, on behalf of We the Celestials, fourthly, on behalf of We the Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details can be found in the description below. Lastly, if you're interested in what we do here at We the Celestials, I'd like to extend an invitation to join the team. The only caveat is that we only accept members from 16 years and up to join our crew. You can sign up for whichever category fulfills your interest by joining the Recruitment Discord using the link in the description below. We're always looking for members to join us. Well, that's it from us for today's video. So thank you all for watching, and have a great day.